You're on. Sorry? You're on. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and wor- welcome to the latest Cart Fix Live. Obviously, the main purpose of this is to do the live Q&A and interact with you, the member. Um, any good questions, questions that we like, we're going to give away a free tub. Uh, all questions are good. It's, wor- it's worth knowing all questions are good. Oh, yeah, but well, any questions you prefer. <laughs> yeah, questions that we really like. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, we're going to give away a free tub of these mainline Bonoffi cell pop-ups. Um, they're exclusive to us. You can't buy them anywhere. They're really, really nice. Um, we're also going to discuss the next um, giveaway, which is um, obviously you can see the reels, which is last month's giveaway, which we're going to draw. But next month's giveaway is five Sticky Baits bundles uh, worth roughly £100. We haven't actually calculated how much they're worth yet. But um, there's... Five, five, gonna be five winners, all gonna win five kilos of sticky krill active, krill active 16, 16 mil, millers, yeah. Um, some liquid, some pop ups, some hook baits, you know. That's I'll give you the full, I've got the full on. list here. So you've got, uh, yeah, five kilos, 16 mil krill active. Um, you've got uh, the krill active 16 mil wafters, which are down there somewhere. Also, the krill active 16 mil tough ones, uh, pure shrimp liquid, and the pure fish liquid, which are both new, I think. I did get a, an update from Tom. I think they're out on around like the 9th of September. So they're like a brand new, brand new product. Brand new product. Um, and they, yeah, they, they look, they look good. They look um, stinky. Yeah. That's what they look like. Yeah. Stinky. Some 14 mil Mulbs pastel pop-ups, which look rather good as well. Um, they're the ones that I've Hang seen. Tom, Tom, Tom's used those a lot. Um, they smell like marzipan. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then the 900 grams of the four mil bloodworm uh, pellets, which again Tom always puts in in his mix. Yeah. So um, yeah, that's the there's five of those. Yeah. So they um, they'll be drawn in October's live feed. Yes. Yeah. Start of October. Yeah. Uh, tonight's the big one. Three yeah. Days, yeah. Yeah. SCWs. Yeah. And we might have another box down there. You they're here by the way. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, that for next month. The month that's after. for the month after. Yeah. Yeah. Or we could save them. Yeah, we could save them. <laughs> Yeah, there's a, another set of nice reels coming yeah. shortly. Yeah, um, very nice. Very nice. But um, should we kick things off with uh, a little, you could do a little um, chat about uh, the Tom Maker film, as in obviously you were there. I have yeah, watched we, it. Yeah, so Tom Maker's film was, um, it was like split into two really. We, we So we do three nights um, and to start off with, we were originally going to fish on Thorny Weir. Yeah. Because that's where you know Tom wanted to fish and he'd fished there previously. We ended up going on to Mets because it was so busy, yeah. And we we wanted to approach the venue as a regular would, where we didn't have a swim roped off, yeah, because we like to do that sometimes. So, most of the time, yeah, most of the time, <laughs> there are times when we physic like physically can't like if we go go to like Norton Disney recently for example yeah. there's no way we can make well, especially Tom a four four and a half hour trip yeah. turn up and the lake's full so we have to do something but uh, yeah. anyway yeah we, we ended up going on Mets um, which is a, the lake next door um, still like on the Thorny Weir like complex yeah. um, started on there really difficult uh, there were fish really like going around in the edges all those swims were taken so we ended up going back onto Thorny Weir for the last two nights yeah. and um, fished in a swim where uh, he, he used um, Wayne Mansford's baiting pole. So he, yeah. he got him, yeah, to, he got him yeah. to come yeah. to the lake, uh, drop that off, um, tried that. Basically, I put a GoPro down, which you, you would have seen on some of the footage. The fish were literally going under the tree. Yeah. Um, so we, they were there. Just, not lots of them though. No, nah, not loads. That's the thing. Like, yeah. like Tom said in the video, that it wasn't enough to create that that you situation. Feeding frenzy, kind of. You're about to yeah. get one. Like yeah. margin fishing is always a little bit like you get one and then they might yeah. go. Yeah. But anyway, fish there one night, nothing happened. Moved to the next swim, which was almost opposite on the same tree line, but further down. And yeah, on the last night, he managed to get this crazy fully scale 30 pound I 14 think, ounce or something I think the real takeaway from having watched it I watched it the mm. day before yesterday um, for me was it was the don't give up and don't settle mm. if, if you're not happy in the swim you are sometimes you do have to go through the motions mm. but it doesn't mean that you should let your senses become yeah. like dampened and yeah. sort of beaten up and he was he, 
wanted to make it happen. Mm. And in the three nights that he had, he made it happen at well, the he, end. Yeah, like, as soon no, as he got any good swim, basically. Yeah, and like yeah. just just by asking the guy next door to borrow his bait boat allowed yeah. him to get where just that just because he could cast you know how accurate it is but he could cast really accurately up to those trees but he didn't because he didn't want to disturb it he was it. on the last night yeah he it wanted was... to just like almost hand place it yeah and by using a boat he could you know he could effectively do that and he yeah he, he caught, do what you got to do to yeah, get the result one. you need yeah so it was a good result in the end but we'll, we I said to Tom today actually we'll get we'll have to get him on for another um another live yeah um just so he can he can talk about things but talking of Tom we do have a little video so I've started to every month I'm going to do something with Tom it might we might do the odd one with someone else but um it's basically a little monthly tip um so this month is all about September obviously it's starting to get a little bit cooler so this is how Tom um, would approach um, the start of September onwards. Good evening, everybody. I hope you are all keeping well. And if you've been out on the bank, you've been catching plenty. And if you haven't been out on the bank, you've been getting your gear prepped. Because in my opinion, as we enter the month of September, I would say this for me is my favourite month to go fishing. Now, we have all just endured a pretty long, dry, bleak summer, if you like with no real weather conditions for angling, so to speak, whatsoever. I can't remember the last time I went fishing in a big south southwesterly, low pressure and raining. But over the years gone by, September on the calendar is always a very, very good month for carp fishing. It's the time of year where we start to see the real weather changes, the water cools down and the fish massively get on the feed. So a couple of little things that I do to sort of put you on the front foot, if you like, as we go into September, is first of all applying a little bit more bait now the summer that we've just experienced has been very very good it's been very warm and in turn it's given the carp a, uh, a good opportunity to spawn and a lot of lakes that i fish the fish have managed to actually spawn a couple of times and they are well down in weight now the only way that them fish are going to put the weight back on is by eating anglers bait and as the weather starts to turn certainly now is when the fish are going to be down and they're going to be having a little feed up so Whilst I would probably start off with a similar amount of bait, sorry, as what I normally would, 10 to 15 spawns after each fish, I'd probably up it to maybe five or eight spawns after each fish rather than just a couple. Because I think once the fish get on your spot, they're going to be a lot more hungry, a lot more ravenous, and they're going to be eating a lot more bait than what they normally would do. So yeah, certainly increasing the bait that you're putting in is a massive, massive edge. And not only that as well, and I'm sure all of you watching this will know that because of what's happened over the last 18 to 20 months with COVID and people not being able to go fishing and more people getting into fishing, the lakes have seen an increasing amount of pressure as well. Now, in turn, I personally feel, and I don't know how other people feel on this, it has made the fishing a lot more tricky than certainly what it used to be a couple of years ago. The fish are being fished for a lot more than what they normally would have been. Therefore, they're seeing a lot more. So this time of year, just refining your accuracy and making sure everything is absolutely bang on. Now I say this all the time, accuracy is one of the biggest things. You know, if you're next to a couple of guys and you're say fishing in the middle of them, if your bait is presented better than those either side of you, not necessarily you've got to be further out, but if your bait is presented better than what their bait is, it is going to be you, the one that's going to put those extra few fish on the bank. So certainly accuracy is a massive, massive key, as well as adding a little bit more bait after each fish to keep them down there. And an example of this as well, and you know, this is another little thing before I uh, before I sign off, this is another little thing, is not being tempted to put the zigs out. Now, normally this time of year, I'd be a sucker for chucking a zig out. But over the past sort of 18 months, and certainly this time last year was when I had a real good run of big fish. And the reason for that was, is I wasn't tempted to chuck zigs out. This time of year, those big fish, they've spawned, they've lost a lot of weight, and the only way those big fish get back up to their optimum weight is through eating. So normally for any for the hours of daylight, should I say, I'd be putting zigs out to try and get a couple of bites just to get a few fish in the net. But now I sort of steer away from putting the zigs out and I will stick on the bottom, even through the daylight hours when it ne might not necessarily look the best. Stick down on the bottom because if you're gonna catch a big carp, now is gonna be the time that you're gonna do it. So yeah, so hopefully you can pick up a couple of things from what I've said there. 
And if you are planning a trip, I wish you the very, very best of luck and make sure you catch yourself a unit. Thank you very much. Okay, so we are back. Um, just going to give you my take on September fishing. Um, and the real, again, I, I say this quite often a lot in the lives, is that um, there is no one coverall for fishing. You know, each lake is unique. Um, but lots of the points that Tom made, um, I agree with. Um, you know, th as the water cools, the fishing does tend to get a little bit slower. Um, but the bigger fish in September uh, are definitely on the feed. Um, and you notice that in the autumn, big fish do tend to get caught through the autumn as they're putting on, putting that weight back on from post spawning through the summer. Um, and I think lakes are full of natural food when the water's at its warmest. And as the water starts to cool in September, like the grassy sort of weed that's in lake dies off, um, lots of the natural food has been eaten. And that is when they can turn to the angler's baits in some situations. And on the other hand, if you get weed beds that collapse and the fish can really turn onto the natural. So there's no hard and fast rules other than September is the beginning of the end. You know, you are, it's going, the temperatures are going down from, from this point forward. Um, and I like September, October and November are up there for me. You know, they're really important months in the carp calendar. But yeah, lots of what Tom said there I agree with. But again, it is very much situation dependent. Should we move on to the to questions? The questions. Question time. Yeah, so yeah. We've, got, uh, we've got lots of questions coming in. It's also worth noting uh, that we have a nice new... Um, updated app. Oh, yes, that's worth a mention. Yeah, you yeah, go yeah. for it, yeah. Yeah, while we, uh, Tom was talking and we were sat here twiddling our thumbs, um, one thing that we discussed that's really worth um, doing, if you haven't done already, is updating your app. So if you downloaded your app months ago, a few weeks ago, it will be an older version than we currently have, and uh, the update is a, is a good one. So you can go back and, um, what's it called? When you find your place in the video. Uh, yeah, continue watching. Continue watching, yeah. um, which is a nice new yeah. feature. Um, seeing the comments on these live feeds, that's new. See, it? yeah, so you can if you like. I'm watching now at the moment on the, on the uh, on the live feed. The live chat is directly below. Whereas those of you that have been here from earlier on uh, will know that it was very difficult to. Um, see the to see the comments, yeah. Yeah, um, so yeah, yeah so. make the update, make the update, yeah, delete the, the old update. app, and, and also I think the down, like the download section as well. Some like on the original uh, version we did, the um, sometimes you would go to download a video, and then it would, uh, like if you left the screen, it would just it would not continue downloading. Yes, but now you can, as long as your app's open and it stays connected, it should stay downloading. Yes. Um, and also, we've had actually another good point is you had quite a few people just emailing asking about it. When you download, there's an option. If you go to the top left hand side where your little icon is, or if you've got a picture there, click on there, and then there's a, a turn um, on or off uh, download via Wi Fi. So if you want to use your mobile data to download the videos as well, you'll need to untick um, that. But if you just want to use Wi-Fi, that is how it's already set. So um, some people don't see the download button, and that's because it's only on Wi-Fi. That's how it's preset. Okay. Um, so if they're out on the bank, they'll be like, well, I can't download, and that's why. So, um, yeah, it's just worth – because I've, I've had a few people ask about it. So okay. uh, should you go question? Yeah, I think it's about time we had a little question. So we've got Charlie uh, Kelly. has asked, when fishing the rock-hard waters and the grind is getting tough – uh, do you have a backup runs water to lift spirits or just carry on through the grind? Um, these days, I, yeah, I don't really get stuck into big grindy campaigns as much as I used to. I tend to, if, if it's rock hard, I tend to try and drop in at prime time and just, you know, I, yeah, a different sort of mindset these days. In the old days, I'd pick a fish and grind it out. Whereas now I just tend to drop in when it's hot and go real tough. So if it's if it's fishing tough and I sort of can calc like I think I understand why it's hard, then I'll back off until prime time because you know ultimately time can't be refunded and you want to use use it wisely, use it at the right time. So yeah, I go to I go to the right water for the right time and I try not to just grind it out these days. Nice. Uh oh, these are coming in thick and fast. 
Uh, Joshua Moran has asked, do carp have favourite weed? Uh, the lake I fish is so weedy and has different weeds in it and they always seem to sit in the Canadian pond weed. What was the... Where did we fish in that have got that... that what's it called? That like long... Grassy weed? weed. Yeah. Where was that? I don't know. Or was that with someone else? Was that with Tom maybe? Yeah, maybe. I might be with Tom at, yeah, at Mets. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was loads of it. Yeah. They can't like all weed from, from what I've experienced, you know. they. I wouldn't say oh, I've got a favourite... Like, my, I've fished around Canadian pond weed the most, you know, that's I'm from Chelmsford, Essex, fished the quarry as a young lad, I fished lots of gravel pits and the weed in those gravel pits that I've tended to fish in the UK tend to have um, Canadian pond weed um, and I've done best fishing on small gravel patches around weed beds, you know, like finding little polished areas um, on other waters where you have like what I would call like blankety weed. Um, you know, I've not done great fishing on blanket weed. I have caught fish doing so, but I've certainly not. I find blanket weed and want to chuck a choddy on it straight away. Um, I don't think I don't feel that blanket weed holds carp. It's not. It's not really a, a weed bed. It's just part of the lake bed. Um, so yeah, Canadian's a great one because the fish do. If it's dense, they do feel comfortable in it. Um, they love the kelpie type weed. They really like that. Um, I've never experienced it myself, but people tell me they love the onion weed. Um, but yeah, gem generally carp do like weed that gives them cover. I think it's more to do with the cover and the sanctuary rather than it just being a weed. Like I said, the blanket weed doesn't offer sanctuary and it doesn't really hold the carp in the same way that other weeds can. Cool. Um, Jimmy... Oh, this uh, it keeps I, when I get a question, it kind of jumps. It's, that's another little thing I've got to fix. <laughs> <laughs> Jimmy is asked, thanks a lot for your techers. Took eleven thirties on the rigs this se this season. Eleven thirties. Nice. Send what? us some pictures. We like to see pictures. Yeah, we can we can drop them in on our social. Yeah, media. I have got some to put up that people have sent in. So yeah. yeah, if you've got any pictures on on like on these pop ups, like if you've caught any fish on these, um, send us some pictures because we like to see them. Um, and we'll certainly make use of them if uh, if you if you'd like us to. Yeah, that, that combi multi rig it's nothing new, um, but it's it works. Yeah, know? and anything that means you haven't got to keep tying rigs, you know, if you can, mm. you go through hooks, and if you don't have to tie fresh rigs, and you can you you get in mega value for money if that rig just stays on on your rod permanently. Yeah. It's, um, it's a really good, a really good presentation, really convenient. Yeah, uh, Saws, who uh, is has been here from day one, and I'm sure many of you have been. Uh, he's asked a question. He's asked uh, when being stuck in a swim, for example, with a draw in a match. Oh, uh, are there yeah. any ways to try and influence the carp to move towards your swim? No, like that's the, the you know, that is. The, is there a secret yeah, liquid? Yeah, maybe <laughs> there is that I don't know about, but. Um, <laughs> You know, that's my idea of a nightmare, being in, in the wrong swim without the option to move mm -hmm. and having to watch, watch somebody else fish for them. Um, it's like watching another man in your house. Here, but you, you just don't want that. You, mm -hmm. you want to be in the right swim. But I can't... Yeah, I, I haven't got an answer that's going to help you in that situation. You know, I, I just sulk in that situation. <laughs> but it, it's certainly not turf out loads of bait because if the fish aren't in front of you, loads of bait isn't going to change that. You yeah. Know? Um, you still want to be just fishing well and wait for the fish to move in. The so. only thing I could think is it's a bit of a gamble when you're match fishing, but obviously the pressure, if someone's putting loads of pressure on and you take that pressure off by taking your lines out, which you probably wouldn't want to do in a match, but no. could that potentially bring them over a little bit? Maybe, yeah, you could do, but I would probably just get my traps out, make sure that I've done it well, yeah. and then just leave it. And pray. Because, yeah, just because... If they come and then you've got to recast, you've got to disturb yeah. the swim. So yeah. you might be better just getting out well and just sitting tight. Yeah. Certainly not spawning every two minutes. Yeah. But again, it's all venue dependent. Yeah. I tell a little one when I think I've told it before actually when I was on because um, I fished a couple of the matches and I um, fished opposite Rob and Brad Greening. Yeah. On uh, where the golf course is, I forget the name of it. Like that match kind of lake. It's got a golf course on it. Forget the name of it. But. Um, they were fishing directly opposite us. They got the fish going crazy on zigs, just spotting like loads oh, of yeah, like, yeah. like floaters. Yeah, well, yeah, just all like cloudy stuff going out. 
and me and me and Steve, the guys, we, we just fished directly off the back of them within yeah. our like boundaries. But it, all the stuff was coming out into our swims. We just fished off the back of them. They qualified in their section. We did in ours because. Yeah, yeah. But we took that opportunity. We were like, "Hang on, they're like." Yeah, yeah, yeah. You'd be they're afraid. going for it. Yeah. We weren't putting any bait out. <laughs> <laughs> just casting zigs long. Yeah, yeah. It's worked. <laughs> But, um, okay. right let's have a little look um, so we've got Jimmy Taylor Guard has asked if you were seeing fish showing in your swim what would be your go to rig hook bait as a single so you're going to whack out a little single um, we'll give him a tub as pop ups yeah? yeah Jimmy Taylor let's give him a tub as pop up um, again situation dependent you know if the water is clear and we're talking in the spring um then a yellow pop-up is quite often my go-to, you know, a pineapple juice from Mainline, Essential Cell, um, Essential IB, you know, they're, they're all proven yellow hook baits that I've done really well in the spring in clear water. Um, I feel in the summer or in a murky water situation, um, a solid bag could be a better option in, in this in this day and age. I think there's these single pop-ups have definitely been fished a lot heavily, and if the fish are pressured, um, they certainly can ignore them. Um, and they, in the Priory Park film, like like um, that we done a little while back, you know, that's a perfect example. Tiny little park lake, clear water, fished to death with pop-ups. The fish have seen it, even though there's a lot of fish. Tiny little lake, they've seen it, and they just ignore it and then we we came in with solid bags and just that little parcel of food you know that can be it's a, it's a deadly deadly method the um solid bag when done correctly yeah um okay let's have a little look steve middleton has asked when fishing a weedy water which uh has a hard bottom how would you go about placing a rig a weedy water which has a hard bottom well that's um you know that's could be any lake that could um you know it's I carefully and meticulous. Like a good example would be our Farlows film. So a um, lot of weed on the bottom in in the swim that we fished. I don't know. I'm meticulously plumbed, and I demonstrated about the lead swinging back and how to spawn accurately, how to make sure that the um, the bait is landing over the rig. And as as Tom was saying in his uh, little September thing, you know, the real thing that separates the good anglers from the average ones is is accuracy attention to detail when they sit down and they're finished doing what they're doing you know they are fishing well as in the the hook bait is on the clear spot the rig is on the clear spot the bait is over the top of that um and a lot of the times when you're less experienced or inexperienced when you sit down it isn't quite sat right you know so spend the time in a, in a weed on a, on weedy lake spend the time plumbing getting the bait over the top of the rig calculating the swing back making sure that you get a good drop when you put the rod out. They're the things that will really, really make the difference. Uh, best Give him a tub of pop-ups as well. That's a nice question. Steve. Yeah. Sorry, that's really awkward when I say that. That's all right. Yeah, that's all right. I've, I can find them. Uh, right, let's have a little look. So we had uh, Matthews asked, what's the best hook pattern for a spinner, spinner rig? You know, I'm going to say Y-gate because yeah. I use Y-gates all the time. But I have had... A few hook pulls, uh, more than a few hook pulls, fishing spinner rigs. You know, they're I'm I'm actually off of the spinner rig at the minute. Mm. Com I'm completely off of it. Not just because I'm I've fallen in love with my combi multi rig, um, but in, recently I fished um, for a thinking tackle shoot. Also recently in May for Corda, and I was fishing uh, stiff hinge rigs, um, and I was just getting much better hook holes with that presentation than I was you know I've used spinner rigs I've caught a lot of fish on spinner rigs but I've also dropped not we're not talking like 50 50 but I'm not happy unless I'm landing nine out of ten nine out of ten is my number and if it's less than that I'll make an adjustment if it's more than, if I'm getting more than nine out of ten and I'm happy um, and I, I just found myself not getting nine out of ten that frequently on the spinner presentation so I'm not saying it's no good um, but for me, it's you know, I, with a wide gape, it's it's good. I wouldn't say it's great, um, and I haven't used enough of the other patterns on it to be giving anyone advice on it. You know, I know mm. uh, Dan at Corda uses those new um, claws and stuff, um, and there's obviously curve people using curve shanks. But yeah, for me, I've I've moved off of that and I'm onto the old stiff hinge again. I um 
when I worked at Corda, I did a video with Tom Dove. Yes. Um, at Golden Gates, a syndicate <laughs> in Essex. Yeah. And that was all around the spinner, spinner rig when it was kind of starting to get used a lot. Yeah, right so it's probably we do quite a lot of technical stuff because it's a masterclass. He tells you what um, hooks he would use and, and wouldn't advise using. He's so using, it's what's it called? He, he uses a claw. Is it a claw? <coughs> no. no, it's crank. 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 Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. He, yeah. He uses quite a few different hooks. Basically. Anything without an outturned eye, I think it was. Yes. Um, even long shanks. Like yes. I know Dan's yeah, yeah, used yeah, them with long yeah, shanks. Yeah. So there's a, there's an awful there's probably more hooks that you can use than you can't. Yeah, you can. Uh, yeah, as long as it's got a, it's not got a back turned eye, yeah. it'll it'll work well on, yeah. on a spinner rig. But that video is is a like is a good it's it's a good example or it's a good for you know if you want to know more information about how um you know the likes of Tom use it yeah, then it's yeah. it's a good that video to watch. Loads of views on YouTube. Yeah. Loads yeah. Uh, let's have a little look. Um, right, so we've got one from Matthew. He's asked, Hi, Darrell, thank you for answering my question last month about maggots and spotting. I watched the Farlows video again, which helped me. I went down to my local lake and pre-baited by trying your method, and it helped me catch a few fish. So it's good. good. Uh, on a number of your videos, I see that you use a bait boat. Can you please explain the best way to feel your lead down when using one, please. Uh, P.S. How did you get on in France after the last live video? Okay, so the bait boat is relative. I've used bait boats over the years for baiting up. And in recent years, I've started, when I can, put my rig in them. And I did so at Wazing. Um, and I was learning on the job as in how to feel the lead down from the boat effectively. Like the first session, I wasn't really a master of it, but I got better at it at it as the sessions went on and i found the best way to do it is keeping the line tight to the boat until you're happy with its position once you're happy with the boat's position i would bring the rod to where i would want to feel the lead down like i'd get it to that position with the boat in its spotlight so um and then i would let a couple of more coils align off so it went slack and that meant that the bait that the lead wouldn't shoot out of the boat and come towards me. It could fall on the slack line. And that little bit of slack gave me time to go forward with the rod. So I wasn't trying to swing the lead away from the boat. I was just trying to stay in contact with it and get it to hit the bottom directly under the boat. So, yeah, keep tight until you've got the boat where you want it. Let off a couple of turns of slack. Drop the old hopper door. And then as you feel the line tighten up, just ease the rod forward so you're not swinging the lead away from your bait. And just feel it down. Um, and with braid, it's uh, braid. It's really, really good. And how did we get on in France? We done. I wouldn't say we murdered it. Um, yeah, it was I, difficult at the start. It yeah. was really difficult. We had a, a difficult start and a difficult end. We had a good middle, didn't we? Yeah. Well, you you had a day. I think it might have been the Tuesday or something or the Wednesday. Yeah. Where you had like in the morning, you had like six or seven fish. Yeah, something like that. There are an awful lot of grass carp. Yeah, we I actually had... look back at some of the footage. Yeah, and um, some of the fish showing are actually grass carp. Right. Okay. Yeah. There was a lot of grass carp in amongst the carp as yeah. we were getting takes. But yeah, we caught. I don't know how many. I th like at the time, I thought we caught fifteen carp. Mm. But looking back, I think we caught ten carp, ten to twelve carp, something yeah. like that. Um, Scotty caught the biggest one. Oh Hard, yeah. Hardly fished, but caught the biggest one, 54 pounder. Um, <laughs> on, on your spot. <laughs> that was, was you, spot. you reeled it in nearly all the way because I was playing another fish. <laughs> yeah. But you basically gave me, I, I said, don't like, you just bring it in, it's fine. And then you were pretty adamant. So um, I took the rod back off. Yeah. yeah. yeah the, the fish in there fought really, really hard. So we were catching sort of mid 30s. Um, all the way in, I was just thinking, this is going to be a monster. And then it just wasn't. Well, I was playing one, that common, I was playing probably mid, upper 30. Yeah, 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 yeah. I was playing that for longer than it took you to... Get the big one. Yeah. In. Yeah. But yeah, we had, we had a good time, you know. It was, it was a, a no-stress session, which it was meant to be. Yeah. We had big a big double swim. Scott, what was that? You had that a tent, tent I, up, and didn't you? Like a tent, yeah, like a, I don't know what they're called. It's like a... An avid thing, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, with a little porch. It's it was, like a social bivvy Yeah, thing. social bivvy. We yeah. had barbecues every night. Um, yeah. No stress. Caught some fish. Lovely times all around. So, yeah, we try to... In this in that video, it is... We're just trying to demonstrate uh, or show, um, you know, like the commercial side of a French venue. Like yeah. how... There, there, although we went there 
um, you know, to you know, ultimately have a nice time and catch some carp. We, like, I still got Daryl to give some information as to how he's approaching the session. So that video will be out um, at the start of it's September, start of October. So it's actually going to come out in like four weeks. Yeah, yeah. Rather, pretty yeah, fast we, turnaround. Yeah, pretty quick turnaround with that one. Um, so yeah, that that will be out pretty soon. Uh, Stephen Pegg, like you fished. Uh, I'm on uh, Baden Hall um, Quarry right now. Wait, wait. He's had a 42 pound mirror. Nice, nice, yeah, very nice. We never had any 40s when we were there, did we? No. no. Um, what was it? Bit 30. Yeah. Uh, okay. So Neil, back on the topic of France. Neil Brinkworth has asked, uh, "Hi guys, going to France in October. How would you fish a 17 acre clay bottomed lake with no features as such, no weed, gravel, etc." Um. You know, one of the things that we I probably done wrong on this recent session um, to France is I didn't come with different options. I only came with boilies and a few tiger nuts to use as hook baits, etc. Um, and it does help, you know, if you, if, depending on the nuisance fish situation. But you need it is good to have a few different options. You know, um, spe- when did, what time of year is it going? Uh, I think it was. I think it was October. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, October. Yeah. Yeah. So for next month, for example, when I went to, um, I fished on a a lake in Germany um, from for, from Autumn Masterclass, and to start with, I went in heavily on the boilies and crumb and a few tigers and stuff. Um, and as the session progressed, I then started using maize, and the maize definitely worked really well. And I know that at Gigantica, the maize can work really well as it starts to cool off. So maize costs nothing as well. It's, it's really worth having, a, depending on the nuisance fish situation, it's worth having something other than just some boilies. You know, take boilies by all means, but have some maize, have some hemp. And if there isn't nuisance fish, you won't go wrong with some maggots. <laughs> you, you know, like those, those real murky French lakes that haven't got roach in and stuff, I, I know guys that have taken 20, 30 gallons of maggots to lakes and literally nearly caught every carp in the lake because they've never seen it before. Mm. Um, obviously, it's situation dependent. If there's loads of nuisance fish, you can't do it. But yeah, um, yeah have some bait options. You know, def- definitely maize, definitely a bit of hemp um, and obviously you boil these. Yeah. Uh, okay, Wayne Collins has asked, uh, Daryl, I'm new to zig fishing. Do you act on every beep or do you wait for a proper take? <laughs> You know, that will only come with experience, you know. Um, you know, you ha- When you get a single beep and it's a take, it's not the same as getting a single beep and it's not a take. And what I mean by that is you need to be able to see that something is happening, as in is there a continuous pull on the bobbin? Is the line get- getting tighter even though it's not bleeping? Is the line falling slacker even though it's not beeping? Um, so, yeah, a single beep isn't a great description of of what's going on you know the beep alerts you to something going on but then it's your you've got to look at it and decide whether something is happening you know you have to read read the line whether it's tightening whether it's slackening or whether it was just the wind you know because a lot of the time a single bleep isn't a bite but it can be cool uh jim has asked do you think braided mainline will soon become the normal on all waters no i think especially not in the uk we are a little island that just loves rules you know it's oh, you can't go out in the boat on here you can't do this you can't do that you you can't throw this bait in you can't use that bait you know it's and braid is what on so many venues it's banned you know it's i i don't use it as a first choice i, I like fluorocarbon for my general general carp fishing um but it's definitely in certain situations the best you know at, at wazing for example when we're fishing across those snags you know, if you're fishing locked up at 100 yards, on the take, on the stretch in the line, they could they can run a rod length. They can run a rod length and get into the trees before, without even if you're holding on tight, the stretch of the line can take you in there. But the braid, you know, they can't. There's no stretch, so they can't do it. But you know, I don't think it will become general use because because too many fisheries ban it. Yeah, I think there's always there's always going to be like yeah. there's. A, there's yeah, there's always going to be waters that are no to braid. Yeah. Um, Adam has asked, uh, when there is no sign of fish, uh, what would your approach be? Front of the weed, area, depths, 
uh, area of, of depths, I guess, uh, or zigs. So how, how would you approach uh, if there's no sign of fish? Get on your toes? Well, yeah, I'd just pick a room with a view normally. Uh, obviously, depending on the stock of the lake, let's say I've seen nothing and I know there's hundreds of fish in the lake or even thousands, then I'll, in that situation, I'll probably pick a very obvious feature that think I look an island, some reeds, some lily pads, something very obvious. Or on a big open lake, I'll pick the middle, you know, somewhere with a big view. But on a, on a low stock lake, you know, just I'm just I wouldn't put a lot of effort into fishing until I did see something because you know it's you, you don't want to be a busy fool. You know, the wazing film showed that like when I couldn't get in to swim where the fish were, I just didn't fish. You know, and that you know not being trapped to your swim by a set of rods can be of better use to, of your a better use of your time than just like as we say drowning some maggots you know wasting your time so yeah i would say on a a lake full of fish pick an obvious feature or the middle on on a low stock lake a really difficult one just just don't tie yourself off enjoy being there and i enjoy searching so it it, whether I, i can't bring myself to put the effort in to start fishing unless i think the 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 reward warrants the effort you know that's sort of what i'm trying to get at yeah uh jared has said i bumped into scott and tom at norton nice to meet you jared i don't i I mean we met quite a few people but it was it was nice to meet you maurice has said evening sam has said hi daryl andy said all right gents those of you that are just joining us we are going to do the draw for these uh tasty looking reels (sighs) scott wanted to use them in france but i said no (laughs) they're nice reels aren't they They so we're going to give those away uh by, yeah by the end of the by the end of the the, the live um yeah over 1500 pounds if you were a member last month then you uh you are in the draw um and also we've got some pop-ups that we are giving away so if you uh if you keep asking your questions daryl or myself might uh, um send uh send a pot your way so yeah get your questions in we're, we're going to keep firing away with them um, so Michael has asked if you could have uh, any swim on any lake in the UK what would it be uh, because if we all could we would if what if I could have any swim any swim on any lake in the UK it's a it's a really random yeah really random yeah let's have a pop up today yeah yeah let's give it some <laughs> Um, I've obviously on certain lakes over the years I've had favourite swims um Wellington Country Park, Hole in the Bush. You know, I had some real good fun in there once I got to grips with it. Uh, Rockford, when I fished there, I had a really good time in Peg One. You know, when we were at Wazing, oh, I've had a really good time in the bowl. Um, but one of my favourite, favourite swims of all time um, in the UK was the Bailiff's Point, swimming around in the sanctuary. So you, you, you'd have your rods in all day and you'd be looking at these fish, like I used to say, looking at what's on the menu. <laughs> you'd see them all <laughs> swimming around in the day, having a real relax. No point in fishing because you know all the fish are in the outer bounds. Mm. And then of an evening, you'd go around, chuck your rods out, have your dinner, go to sleep, knowing that they're going to be drifting out under the cover of darkness. And yeah, um, yeah that's yeah, that's one of my favourites. Nice. Uh, so we might have touched this already because we talked about fishing clay bottoms, but we'll we'll do it again just in case. So clay Sam, bottoms. Yeah, so Sam has asked, "What's your go-to setup and rig for fishing a clay bottom?" Um, uh, you know, I like a leg clip where I can, you know, I really I like a leg clip presentation. If it's hard clay, you know, you're going to get good presentation with that. You know, I don't use inlines enough these days, but they are one of the best hooking mechanisms. But I, I, I should say full clay, I would probably find myself using a leg clip. Yeah. I mean, I, that's what I see you using those an awful lot, like yeah. prob- over over like the heli safe. Yeah, I would yeah, say a lot of the lakes we fish with leg core is banned. You know, yeah, that's yeah. another one. Leg core is mm. banned on a lot of venues, um, and I do like where possible to have a little bit of tubing or something just to protect the fins. Yeah, on the fight where possible. Another another um, touch on the rigs then. So Mark has asked. Mark Dean's asked. Your rigs can be very basic. Mark Dean. Yeah, you know oh, Mark Dean. Yeah, Mark Dean. He's Kodak. You're right. Okay. Your, your rigs can be very basic, so do you really think all these rigs are required when the most basic basic of rigs are just as effective um, we're on the right spot? Yeah, that's when the, on the thing, right spot? you know, it's, for the inexperienced, 
you know, you'll read someone says this rig's the best, yeah. that rig's the best. It's like you know, Simon Crow. I was reading, reading a little bit about him in Carpology recently, um, and he's using extremely basic rigs. And he says the whole industry is telling me my rigs are no good, but I've caught on them time and time again. And the truth is, as Tom shows, as I show, um, you know, that it's placing the rig on the spot with a sharp hook and getting your feed over it the actual rig itself that there's some very very simple rigs out there that are very very effective um and people inexperienced people will think that because they're not using the most technical rig out there that they might be at a disadvantage and if you're of that mindset you're obviously not experienced enough to know that simple rigs will will catch everywhere you know on the the hardest of lakes a knotless knot rig will catch carp end of yeah um emil sounds like he's having a very nice evening drinking some pints and watching carp fix oh. from sweden so oh. hello emil hope you're having a nice time oh. in sweden are there any good good fishing in sweden well someone has been messaging me on um mm-hmm. on instagram with a lake that he wants us to go and film at. is it emil let's have a little emil look. Might be. Yeah. Um, I'd have to look at the yeah. messages. Um, well, Emil, if you know any lakes. Um, yeah. <laughs> and it basically, you show me a picture of a, of a 48 pounder that's sometimes 50 um, and some other like 30 pound scaly ones. But it's some, it, it'd be a long way to travel for fish of that size. Oh, you'd have to go, go somewhere else as well, I think. But it'd be, you, it'd be, it's, it's cool to go and fish with cool carp, you know, especially, yeah, yeah. especially yeah. if it's quiet. You know, for me, yeah. the two biggest things that I want in my fishing are beautiful carp yeah. and space. Yeah. You know, like not people either side of me. You know, a little yeah. bit of room and beautiful carp, but I'm in my element. I bet the scenery is nice there as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Right, let's have a little look. So we've got Aaron. Um, you can only fish one syndicate uh, in the UK for the next five years. What one and why? <laughs> <clears throat> well, if I was only going to fish one lake and I was going to spend five years doing so, then it would go for the Burfield Common. You know, I would commit to that. You know, if that if, if you're going to fish, because you wouldn't want to, let's say, for example, you picked another lake and you went and caught the bigger than it, then you'd be sitting there for five years wondering what you're going to do. Mm. You know, so yeah, if I if I had to fish one lake for five years continuously, um, then it would be Burfield because the fish are still the other fish in there are still getting bigger. The Burfield Common is you know an old fish could drop dead at any minute or get eaten by an I forgot for who knows but yeah it would be Burfield. Yeah, uh, David has asked how do you work out the swing back of the lead across the different depths of water? I know we touch on this quite a lot but obviously people watch at different times and don't watch yeah, back. It's, so it's yeah it's a real skill this you know and there there are formulas but formulas are open to getting it wrong. I find the most effective way is I plumb for my spot until I'm happy with it. On So when my lead lands, it's on the spot. I don't pull onto the spot. It's down, it's on it. So once I'm happy with the length of line that it takes to reach the spot, I will then change the lead for a marker float setup, cast out on that exact clip, don't pull it back, pop the float to the surface, and then spawn to the float until I get it landing exactly right. And then you can work out the difference. But um, the, the if you have, if, if this person who asked the question, we'll give him a tub of pop-ups. David. If he, if he hasn't watched the Farlow's film, I really, really strongly advise that, you're obviously a member because you're here on the live, yeah. and you, you watch the Farlow's film, because I really demonstrate it. And that holding, holding the rod consistently at the same position yeah. while the lead is descending, and finishing with your spot in the same position are two things that no one ever talks about. They go, ah, oh, you just hold, If you, let's say you clip up half a rod length shorter with your spot rod. But if you're holding your rod here one minute, one over there, one over here, then there's no consistency to it. So yeah, watch the Farlow's video um, and be consistent with your finishing rod position with both your fishing rod and your spot rod. Yeah. Uh, right, let's have a little look. We had a good one here. Well, they're all good. I'm just going down literally as people write them. I'm put, I'm just going through them. So hopefully there aren't been any missed. Uh, so Curtis uh, has asked, Evening lads, what sort of subtle changes are you making now or appro- approaching autumn? If Curtis... If you missed the start of this video, we've got a, you can re-watch it um, later, but we do um, 
have make Tom Maker's little monthly tip where he talks about what he changes going into like September. So, I mean, just cover it briefly because we have covered it yeah. already. Um, you know, alternative baits. Um, some lakes I will be starting to put a bit of maggots out. You know, people go, oh, maggots in September, but a lot of lot will say, you know, there's a, people's like an average rig length, I would say, is between five and nine inches, which only is like a four inch window. I would suggest a six inch rig is relatively short and a nine inch rig is approaching quite long. Um, and the thing with a longer rig, what's not going to work, what, what's not ideal about it, is it gives the fish a lot of time to work mm-hmm. out it sucks something into its mouth that it shouldn't have and it can eject it before the hook link goes tight. And on the flip side, if the rig's too short, it can at times look too close to the, the rest of the end tackle, spook the fish away, um, and can also, the fish doesn't always get the, the rig, especially if you're using a big bait, get it, get it all the way into its mouth before the hook link tightens. So there is a good reason why there is a an average length, you know, a consistent length. Um, and I, yeah, I can't think of many situations where a, a, a rig over 12 inches is of any benefit. Okay, uh, let's have a little look. So we've got from Adam has asked, if you turn up to a lake with no signs of fish or wind, how would you approach it? Would you wait to see a sign uh, or take a different approach? It's a very similar question. We yeah. had, yeah, had yeah. that. Like, it, it, it comes up every time. What yeah. do you do if you don't see anything? And if, if you're fishing a lake with loads of fish, then you pick a, a, a really nice looking feature, something that's obvious that you think the carp will... Uh, will will visit will are likely to be holding around um if it's a big open lake with lots of angling pressure then fishing long into the middle you know is a very on a, on a real heavily stock water you know one of the, the one of the almost givens on a, on a lake like b1 you know big open gravel pit chance are the fish are out in the middle because the angling pressure puts them there so being out fish out long into the middle um, is a great starting point on a heavily stock lake. On a low stock lake, like you saw of us fishing at Wazing, you know, I, I I can't bring myself to put in the effort to put my rods out if I don't think the return is likely. And, and by putting my rods out, I then trap myself in a swim where I don't know where the fish are. And if you're trapped in a swim, you can't look properly. So low stock lakes, don't fish until you find them. Um, and on the high stock lakes, pick obvious features. Or the middle. Yeah, nice. Uh, so Nathan's got two questions. He's got one for me. He's asked, um, I've got a question for you both. First one's for Scott. Since filming Working With Daryl, is there anything that you've learned from him that you've used in your own fishing? Well, I'd like to say I go fishing an awful lot more than I do, but I don't. <laughs> but oh, like I've worked with Daryl for, well, not just for, with Cart Fix, but since I was at Corda as well, and obviously worked with the other guys that are at Corda, all obviously top anglers, um, and they know their stuff. Um, it, there's so many things. Um, the main thing is, is just watching the water. Like the amount of time, Daryl and Dan, like Dan, relentless. Like he, <laughs> yeah. he we turn up at a lake and we would spend hour well, until we see a fish yeah we that's what we would do and that's the that's probably the main thing that i've learned um obviously the rigs and stuff you see what they're doing and you can like just easily copy that but watching the waters is something that you have to do um yeah. so that's probably the watercraft is yeah like, it's probably the biggest thing in I would these say. videos we show we show how to you know but there are things that are going on in the head a lot of the time that mm. um, the camera's not aware of, mm. you know, and, and the, the thought process. Um, and, yeah, the, the watercraft is as much of, as it, and the looking is as much as the, the putting, like we talked about a minute ago, like the getting the rig on the spot and getting the bait over it. You know, most people that aren't experienced aren't doing that effectively. And if you combine not doing that effectively with not being on the fish, you have got no hope, you know. But when yeah. you align where the fish are, fishing technically well, yeah, it's just putting those 
putting those two things together. Yeah. Nathan, I'll give you a little pot of pop-ups yeah, for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's also got a question for you. Um, yeah. So if you were fishing a lake just for a day that you didn't know much about, would you still lead around, plumb the swim, um, or do you think it would ruin your chances? And how do you tell how deep the water is when just using a bare lead, so not using the marker flow? I would probably just flick out um, if I was fishing a short session and just feel the lead down. Um, and just through experience, I get I can have a rough idea of how deep it is. You know, you'll find that if it's five foot or less, you know, the lead's almost on the bottom the second it touches the water. Um, if there's a little bit of a swing back, you know, it might be between five and seven foot, you know, a little bit more, you know, up to ten foot. And if it's going down for ages, then you know it's really deep, you know. But, um, yeah, that's that's what how I would do it. Okay, I've got a good one. <laughs> you got a good one. <laughs> Maurice has asked, uh, when using goos, I can't help thinking, why not juice, just use a boily of that flavour? We wouldn't order a curry, then put gravy on. Can you help me get my head around this? Loving the channel. <laughs> now, for me, the, the goos, you know, are something to put on your hook bait to make it stand out. Um whether that be for colour, whether that be the attraction in the water, um, if you're going to if you're going to feed loads of bait, and sometimes making it stand out is a good thing, you know. So they're like, they're attracted by the bait, drop in on the on the they drop onto the hook bait because it stands out. Um, a single hook bait, you know, leaking out attraction, bright colour can draw the carp's attention. Um, but yeah, I don't I don't like his analogy there. I wouldn't put it on the curry, mm. but you're going to eat your curry. The, the hook bait doesn't get eaten it goes in the mouth yeah it doesn't get a chance to taste it it's literally just that one of the things that i said i mentioned scott recently one like uh, a similar thing to marketing and carp fishing the two are like an analogy for a carp to take your bait it has to be aware of it if you want to sell something the customer has to be aware of it they're the, they're two things that you know like the, the people um because they cast into a lake blind, they think, um, oh, yeah, the bait will just bring the fish in. And maybe in some cases, the bait stops the fish swimming over. But the reality is you need to go to the fish and show them what you've got and give them the opportunity to take it. And if they're in the mood, then they will. Yeah, nice. Uh, you've got so many questions still coming in. So mm. we'll try and fire through a few. Uh, so Neil has asked, if your life depended on catching a carp and you were only, uh, where has it gone? If you're only allowed three flavours, there's so many coming in, uh, in a homemade boilie, uh, what would you pick? I guess it's boilie, he hasn't put that, but what what three flavours um, would Daryl Peck use? Cell. So cell would be my, my boilie type. Mm. Um, squid goo for me pink hook baits. And then for the yellow ones, <coughs> I would probably at the moment say no name. I would yeah. say, yeah, the 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 squid is. I've just I've got so much confidence in that. The no name has been really good to me recently, and cell has stood the test of time. Um, my, for hook baits as well, the Albanoffi cell, oh, yeah. the Banoffi yeah. cell. Hook well, baits. that's why you had these made like, yeah, yeah. For, for carp fix because you've done so well on them. So yeah, the, the offer still stands. By the way, if you spend fifteen pounds at carpfix.shop, yeah. Get yourself a little tub of these or keep asking questions and we might eventually pick you. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Should we give him a tub of pop-ups? Uh, yes. Uh, Neil. Neil. Okay, let me just write that down. Um, the Emil from uh, Sweden has just asked a question as well. Uh, he's about to fish a 600 hectare lake Wow. Uh, and we'll fish it with a bait boat um, at 200 metres distance. Yeah. Best rig question mark well it depends on the bottom um i think one of the key things when dropping from a bait boat is to have a foam nugget around the hook i think that's important um people aren't especially with sharpened hooks or kamakuras or something like that um really good chance of the hook catching on the hopper door you know the lead shoots at the door as it's opening and the hook can just catch on the very edge it's designed to catch on a fish's mouth why wouldn't it catch on the edge of the hopper door mm -hmm. um so yeah a foam nugget on the, on on the um on the hook um and I, I i think a leg clip or a helicopter rig is is ideal in that situation i think both either or um even at 200 yards 
Is he fishing Brady Mainline? Did he mention he, that? He doesn't say. He, um, but even at 200 yards, you could feel led down on Braid. You literally could. But um, don't have the line. Take the boat to where you want it, keeping the line tight when you've got it there. Let From the set, when you're ready to drop, let yourself out a few feet of line, just a few feet, drop, and you'll see suddenly the line shoot tight as the as the lead's falling, the surface tension, it builds up, a little bit of tension in the rod, go forward so that it doesn't swing away from the um, swing away from the boat and feel it down. But yeah, a lead clip presentation with a combi multi-rig, a stiff hinge rig, or a helicopter, either all be fine. Cool. Finley has asked, hi lads, hope you're having a great day. Uh, what are your general rules with different winds that could present themselves? Have a good and Lars. Um, it's Friday. Yeah. Um, uh, winds. Sorry. Talk to me winds. about winds. Right. Again, situation dependent. You know, everyone says when the easterly comes, when the, when the wind's from the east, the fish bite the least. You know, I've heard that. Northerly is no good when it's northerly. Some of some lakes that I fish, like Coninbrook, a north easterly is the best like, best wind on that lake, and it's more. What's more important is what area of the lake it blows into. If it blows into the the best features, the best weed beds, the best gravel bars, you know, all all of that sort of stuff, then any wind on its day can be good. Um, in the height of summer, for example, when it's 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 real hot, like no oxygen in the water. If you get a beast in easterly that blows in cools the cools the lake down from real hot weather when it's been stagnant in like really stiflingly hot then the easterly can be the best so there's no rules but in the in the autumn i would say i've often done well on the back of the wind um a lot of the time a lot of the time just slightly a little bit warmer there um that in the summer on the wind in the spring not the early spring on some lakes like but the later spring the wind can be good so again you'll hear me say this a million times you need to understand or take note of what the fish in your lake tend to do you know if you see them at a certain time of year react to the wind note what they did you can use that in to, to help you find them next time um, but yeah anyone that says Eastleys are no good Northleys no good they love South Westleys it's all jargon you know it's, it's all dependent on the situation yeah okay cool uh, let's have a little look um, so Alan Groves has asked I'm, I'm giving that guy a pop, pop ups by the way okay. uh, Finley because um, you don't get off and get questions about like the wind and stuff no, like that so I was, we'll just, yeah we'll just give, give some there yeah. uh, Alan has asked uh, hi I only use a two and a half ounce lead and I'm struggling to feel it down even when I clip up have you got any tips um, depends on the depth of water and how far out you're fishing um, but I would say practice at underarm range to start with get a, a, an idea a feel for how it works um, practice in deeper water and then like we've had this question before it's quite, it's quite a common one um, you know like uh, it, even for really experienced carp anglers feeling led down at long range in four foot of water is very difficult you know feeling led down at long range in 20 foot of water is easy you know because you've got loads of time so practice at short range in deeper water um, it, the lead weight is not really important you'll feel it better with a heavy lead but um if you're fishing 20 yards out two and a half ounce lead's more than enough to help help do it but practice when you're not actually trying to catch a fish you know just with your plumbing rod you know just go go to the lake for an afternoon casting about start short work your way out a little bit further but the real key to it is stay if you're using a clip is staying in contact with the lead once the clip brings it out the sky because if, if you hit the clip too hard and it pings back you, you you're not in contact with the lead anymore so you need to you almost want to have the rod to the side anticipating the clip when you know it's close you know you cast out you come to the rod side slowly you hit the clip you cushion it in and as it hits the water you bring it back just a little bit just to take the slack out of the line um to feel it down but again it's, it's a it's a practice makes perfect thing yeah um so tim uh, albone has asked what do you do if you get two tickets that come through that you want to fish how would you divide your time fish one for some months or switch more often weekly etc what would it you depends do what you know you could say certain lakes uh, are 
are better to fish at certain times of year. You know, if you if one's a really good spring water, then you pick, you you fish fish that one. But concentrating on one task at a time is the way to do it the best. You know, but sometimes if you if you know you're flogging a dead horse, if you know, for example, there's a big an explosion of algae or a, a massive natural food hatch on on that lake, and the fish are preoccupied, then you might be better on the other one. It's reading the conditions and the situation, but the to, to make it like a sim- simplify it would be to pick the one that you want to fish and concentrate because your yeah, consistent time putting the pieces of the puzzle together are going to be the things that really help you put those fish on the bank yeah we've had uh, Jonathan is Jonathan and Adam have both said the app is great hundred percent better so that's yeah, good yeah we hope you like it if there are any if there's anything that you would still like to see there are some of the things coming which are quite exciting which i won't announce yet because they're still being worked on but it does involve you guys and you being able to be a bit more um interactive with us um so that's coming soon okay um hopefully further updates yeah further updates. yeah yeah just yeah just another update so yeah there'll be updates coming out of our ears yeah um but yeah so it's good it's good to hear that you uh you you are liking it uh let's have a little look here so we've got mark casey's asked um a question about fishing in a charity match that he's got at the end of september it's a hundred acre lake depths to 40 foot um, any advice other than finding the shallow areas? Have you done much of... Mm, like, well, ma- uh, you know, 100 acre lake, loads of deep water. You're not going to get to pick your swim. Mm. You know, I'll, In a match. In yeah. a match. I'd just say you've got to pray. <laughs> <laughs> pray to get in the hot swim, you know, or the one with all the fish in it. You know, it's, yeah. I, I, I really can't give you any advice mm. with, with any authority that's going to yeah. help you here. You know, it's, yeah. um, you know, if you end up in a 40 foot swim... With no carp, yeah. yeah. If you're in a mat, yeah. If yeah. you're in a match, it's look of the yeah. draw, Make isn't sure it? Your cool box is well stacked. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Look, hopefully, you come out early, ni- early in the draw, and you get a decent swim. Yeah, it sounds like your best, one of your best yeah. Uh, hopes, yeah, or best chances. Maybe um, fiddling the draw. Fiddle in the draw. <laughs> don't recommend that. <laughs> <I'd>, I would. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, right. Let's have a little look. Uh, Thomas uh, Pickford. Uh, Daryl, with your knowledge of fishing on the continent, where would you recommend other than France? As I would love to try fishing somewhere else, less on the grid. But uh, people seem to think that I know a lot about Europe, um, and the truth is I don't. I'm not a very good networker. I'm not someone that is always in people's inboxes um, or texting people. I feel I feel a bit shy about asking. I don't really like to ask. I feel a bit awkward about it. But um, I would say Spain is. You know, if it's not France, you know, Holland and Belgium have um, lots of good waters, lots of anglers. You know, Holland in particular is um, full of carp. You know, the, the certain regions towards the German border that have got bigger ones. Um, and the tickets, the tickets for the fishing in Belgium and Holland are really cheap. It's almost like a rod license. You can fish the whole country. Um, so Belgium, Belgium's full of nice carp. So is Holland. Germany's difficult because you need a, a, a special license. And if it's not going to be France, then Spain's the next one. But Spain's a really, really long drive. Um, I've never fished in Spain myself yet. Um, but I know there's loads of lovely carp there. But yeah, I would say if you're going to be making your first few trips abroad and it's not going to be France, you can pretty much pick a bit of canal anywhere in in Holland or Belgium and be pretty certain that it's got carp in it and big ones too. Yeah, just get out there. I know, you know, just getting out there and exploring places as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. That's yeah, it's the way to do it, isn't yeah. it? Uh, Matthew's got a question about coots. Like chickens. Yeah. <laughs> how, uh, how much can coots eat uh, in kilos? Um, <laughs> trash your spot. Would you top it up after so long? Uh, any way of getting rid of them? Um. Those tufty torches sometimes yeah, work, yeah. sometimes don't. You know, there's it's weird. You know, I've had coots like fly across the site, like leave the lake almost, like from mm. the from the torch. But I've also had other ones look at me with just like, yeah, and what? Um, so yeah, a tufty torch is well worth having. A laser pen, um, but yeah, there's not other than if they're really really bad, keep picking you up. Then you want to fish with something dull on the hook because if you're fishing 
blatant white pop-up. You're just going to get picked up, picked up, picked up. Um, but they are, they're very efficient at doing what they do. I, I remember using Magaliner rigs. Um, and I've been picked up relentlessly on them by, by Coots as well. So there's not a lot you can do to scare them off other than laser pen. You don't want to keep casting them, you know, because you're destroying your swim. Um, one thing that I have done once at Bayswater was I, I cast onto the far bank because it was only like 100 yards to the far bank and I'm fishing in the middle. Um, and I left my braided line across the surface just to, just a few inches off the water um, and every like every time the coots came near it they flew away but by the point I'd got des- by the time I'd been desperate enough to do that um, I just think the fish had already been spooked off by me casting it etc so mm. yeah yeah there's not a lot you can do no no it's nature isn't it yeah don't mess with nature no mother nature is that the right term yeah it's mother nature isn't it yeah. Um, so George Dell has asked hi guys Daryl have you ever had a ticket for a lake and haven't clicked with it or just not got on with it uh, I'm struggling to keep motivated with mine and just wondered if you had anything similar yeah I've had I've, I've had a ticket for a nice syndicate in Northampton never even saw it paid really my, yeah paid, I paid for three years 650 quid three a year yeah, yeah 650 quid paid it three times and never even went and had a look at it <laughs> Um, it was no publicity and because of what I do for work you know it's just at the time I was writing a diary for a fishing magazine it was just one of those I, if I'm going fishing it's handy if I can if I can do my work at the same time you know it's if I did if I worked in a different industry then no no publicity venues would be perfect you know mm. because they'd be quieter um, but working in the industry is just a non-star but um, I joined Burfield for one season fished it a little bit in the spring Dave Lane caught the common then pulled off and then the following year I just I lost lost the buzz for it really I was watching the fish jump in the open water beyond the boys I could have reached them with my casting you know I'm pretty pretty good at that and watching them jump knowing that I could get there but looking at the boys that were in the way it, it annoyed me you know knowing that I could get to them but I wouldn't be able to land them um, and yeah, I just, yeah, I lost a little bit of mojo with it. When there's so many carp in the world that you can go and fish for, um, I, d- I don't like to spectate. When I go fishing, I want to find, I want to seek and destroy. I want to find them, I want to fish for them. I, I can't watch them and not get to them. That's, yeah, breaks my heart. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right, let's do a few more questions and, and the then reels. we'll do the reels. Yeah. 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 So let's have a little look on here. So. Uh, Nathan Brett has asked what is your favourite carp you've caught from a big carp story bear in mind we haven't done them all but what's so far like maybe what's your your favourite carp from what we've done mm. um, oh, yeah I'd say what we've done because that's what people have seen So, well the, the Orient big carp story um, you know for me that was my my Everest um, you know those fish after four weeks of blanking in the mud, you know, they were enough. There's not much that's ever meant so much to me. It's and also targeting UK carp, you're, you're basically go, you're going after a carp you've seen a picture of before to have your turn holding it. Um, and Orient was different, you know, that I'd never seen pictures of those two, like the 57 pounder with a big scar on it or the big 62 pound. I'd never seen pictures of these carp before. So they were like unique and they, yeah, they probably meant the most. Right, I'm, I'm not going to exaggerate here. We've got, I've, I was probably we can't answer a bit more. higher than this. We've got, we've got loads. Yeah. So we'll answer one more and give the reels away. We've got, I've got one more, which has been sent in via email, which is a little bit of a light hearted one, but I'm just going to find it again. Um, so if you didn't have a career, this is from Kev. 21. Um, if you didn't have a career as a carp angler, uh, in brackets, jealous.com, uh, what would you be doing? What else would give you the same passion, desire, and pure obsession daily? Is there anything work wise that could even come close to what you have now? If so, um, what is it? Um, what is it about um, it that makes you tick about fishing? Well, there definitely isn't anything else. You know, I've never found anything remotely that what do you think you would see yourself doing like what I can't I can't you know. like I could see I could probably see myself being like a policeman because I love like watching like traffic cops and stuff 
So what is it? There must be something. Well, I, I applied to get into fire brigade at one point. There you go. Um, so you know that was something that I I like the idea of it because it wasn't a desk job. I like the idea of it because it was a shift job so that I could have the time more to time to go fishing. fishing. Yeah. But um, there's something about not there's something about campaign fishing that does something to me. There's like I find it very hard to get motivated for lots of things. Mm. You know, even fishing at times at mm. certain points. But once I, I set about a task, a fishing task, and I start, once I start and I learn a little bit, it's that 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 learning process that yeah. that is that's what I love. You know, yeah. I like to because I, I feel like I'm very good at working out a lake. You know, I only need a little bit of time to start piecing it together, piecing it together, and I enjoy that that climb to the to the finish. Our, our uh, little promo for the next Cart Fix Live is going to be Daryl Peck the Fireman or something like that. <laughs> You've said it now. You said you were going to be a fireman. Yeah, yeah <laughs> I, I, I wanted to be a fireman and they rejected me. Did they? Yeah, yeah, I applied, yeah. yeah. Anyway, right, let's do it. Let's do it then. So we're going to do the draw for the for the uh, <clears throat> Bayesia 45 SCW QD. SCW is Slow Cross Wrap, um, which Daryl... Uh, kindly inform me which it means exactly what daryl it's to do with the how fast what was that bleep? how fast the spool goes up and down so it's going up and down slow mm. so it means that the, the coils are lying and just stacked behind each other rather than like do good good like, yeah it's not like it's, yeah so yeah let's do let's do the draw so everyone that hasn't uh uh, watched one of these before. I'm going to switch to a different screen, which looks basically the same as this one, but it's just got a little box on it. Someone's name will be there. They're not the winner. They're just the first name that's appeared um, on on the screen uh, in the random list. Um, so I'll do that uh, right now. Uh, so there you've got... Um, You've got. I've changed it slightly, so you've got the person's name and then their unique code, which means nothing to you. But we do have um, some people with the same name. Yeah. So if the per that person comes up, I don't know which one it is. Yeah, so yeah, I've yeah. put their name, their code next to the. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't mean anything to anyone, but it means something to us. So if we do get that, if that happens, then we're safe, basically. Um, so all we have to do is press it once, and then that's going to be the winner. Of these reels, which are really expensive, very intense people. On the yeah, <laughs> but we've got we've got um, a couple of hundred people awesome. at least on the website. We don't get the figures. Yeah. For the app. <clears throat> okay. Um, just yet. Um, be really careful, but just press. I'm gonna oh, let you do it. Done it. You've done it. Oh, I've done it. You every every time oh, you do that, you say don't oh, do it. And you oh, <laughs> oh, 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 I'm gonna let you do it. <laughs> yeah. Right there, you go, Jason. You've done it. All right. So yeah, Jason Etheridge. Is the winner, Jason, um, Jason Etheridge? You've won yourself three dial yeah. Bayesia SCW. Um, we will get them sent uh, by the um, the highest uh, insurance. Yeah, our DPD will look after them. Yeah, yeah. yeah that, that's not one for Hermes. Yeah, <laughs> definitely no, not one for no. Hermes. Yeah. So there you go, Jason. Well done. You have won. Um, uh, this month's or last month's giveaway three yeah. Bayesia 45 SCW Q QDs um, yeah over £1,500 worth you've got three spare spools in there um, we will get in touch with you um, and send them out um, just one last thing maybe to say the Sticky Baits bundle uh, we've got five of those to give away um, this month and then potentially we've got them here we actually have the, the SLDs aren't they? yes we've got Three Daiwa Bayesia SLDs, which are the they're very similar to this, but they've got a wooden handle. Um, mm. You'll have seen them. Um, I think Dan uses them in the videos. Um, but they don't they are up here at seven fifty. Yeah, they're even more expensive than these. Yeah, yeah, so we've got that coming in the next couple of months. So um, yeah, that is something. Obviously, if you haven't won this time, um, then it's something to look forward to. Yeah, yeah, you've got another chance at winning. Yeah, Bayesias. yeah, we've got more reels to come. So yeah, yeah it's uh, it's it's not over just yet. So, yeah. Thank you very much for joining us and we'll see you next time. Thank you very much.